Great. Um, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss this project, which is a collaboration between uh, myself as well as the group at University of Michigan, including Cormac Marr. And this was an extension of the work that I uh, began while I was a resident at University of Michigan. So today I will be talking about a recent report on syringomyelia in children with closed spinal dysraphism, um, looking at long-term outcomes after a surgical intervention. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So as this entire group knows, um, all syrinxes are not created equal. The most common association for syringomyelia is Chiari. However, syrinxes can be seen with a number of different etiologies, including tumor-associated syrinx, uh, idiopathic syrinx, and then um, those associated with uh, spinal dysraphism and tethered cord. Um, each of these distinct associations with pathology may have implications for different pathogenesis, different natural histories, and then finally different responses to surgery. And next slide, please. So this is a breakdown of a consecutive series of patients who were imaged uh, with a finding of syrinx, so about 280 patients. And as you can see here, the most common association uh, for syrinx was Chiari. And I think the pathophysiology of syrinx in the setting of Chiari malformation has been um, well studied. And I think as a group, we probably have a, a better understanding of the pathophysiologic relationships between Chiari and syrinx as we do other pathologies associated with syrinx, such as tethered cord and spinal dysraphism. And just to clarify here, spinal dysraphism um, was, uh, kids with spinal dysraphism were those that had um, intraspinal pathology in addition to a simple fatty phylum. So tethered cord are those with either a thickened or fatty phylum, whereas spinal dysraphism are those with lipomyel, meningocele, myelocystocele, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Um, you can, uh, could you add the circles if you advance, I think, three times? Uh, go back one. Sorry about that. Um, in any event. Um, uh, so what I wanted to show here was that different types of syrinxes have different uh, morphologic characteristics. So um, those with Chiari associated syrinx as well, it's a, uh, it, what, if it's either a uh, Chiari one associated syrinx, um, Chiari zero, zero, or a syrinx uh, associated with a secondary Chiari uh, such as um, that associated with craniosynostosis, the syrinxes themselves are wider, and this is probably something that all of you have observed and know, um, versus those that occur with tethered cord or spinal dysraphism that are typically more narrow. Um, in addition, idiopathic syrinxes are also typically more narrow as well. Um, so what we're seeing here are already um, different morphologic imaging characteristics between the two types of syrinxes. Next slide, please. Um, similarly, uh, the length of syrinx is difference, differs as well, although we did find fewer differences in the length of the syrinx compared to the width when stratifying um, different pathologies associated with syrinx. Next slide, please. So, um, Caitlin, do you mind advancing a few to put the circles up? There, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so here is a graph of the cranial and caudal extent of the syrinxes. So um, with Chiari, we know that the majority of syrinxes uh, start close to the site of pathology, meaning that the majority of the syrinxes associated with Chiari start in the cervical spine. On the x-axis is levels from the frame and magnum, and you can see that our top group, so the three top groups of bars, are all Chiari-associated syrinxes, and they start close to the frame and magnum. Their caudal extent, which is the darker bar associated um, uh, with the lighter gray bar, um, shows the end of their syrinx um, somewhere in the thoracic spine. Um, idiopathic syrinxes are somewhere in the middle. And then finally, if you take tethered cord and uh, so if you take syrinxes associated with tethered cord and spinal dysraphism, what we see is that their cranial extent is lower, meaning they are more caudally located in the spine 
Um, and that is, uh, you know, makes sense and is potentially intuitive given that the site of pathology for um, a syrinx associated with a tethered cord is uh, more caudally located, such as either a low-lying conus or whatever pathology um, we were dealing with, whether it's myelocystocele, lipomyelomeningocele, et cetera. Um, next slide. Um, similarly, this is, again, just rounding out our cohort of patients, all patients with syrinx, those with tethered cord and spinal dysrhythm had a conus level uh, that was low-lying, and therefore their syrinxes were also lower down as the cord was located uh, more caudally in the spine. Next slide. So based on the information that I just showed you, uh, we asked the question, given that a tethered cord associated syrinx is different in morphology from that of a Chiari associated syrinx, do tethered cord associated, associated syrinxes have a different response to surgery? Um, I'll show you at the end of the talk, um, you know, several different recent papers which look at uh, percent reduction in syrinx size after carry decompression, rate of syrinx reduction, and, and we all know as a group that typically uh, syrinx is decreased in size after uh, uh, decompression for carry malformation. What I think is less well known is how syrinxes respond to surgery for tethered cord. Um, it may be, um, you know, something that has, you know, also been observed in the past. It was our observation that um, the response to surgery for cord untethering, the syrinx response to surgery for cord untethering was less well defined. And so we wanted to take a closer look at these patients. So what we did was we took 25 patients in, from the prior series that had a diagnosis of closed spinal dysrhythm, whether that was, um, lipomyelomeningocele, myelocytocele, et cetera, and included those with simple tethered cord. What we did exclude was those with open myelomeningocele. And the reason for that is that um, the pathophysiology of a syrinx in someone with an open myelomeningocele is complex and may um, have contributions from both altered CSF flow at the craniosubrachial junction as well as cord tethering. So those patients were excluded. So that left us with 25 patients. The average age at surgery was about three and a half years. And the average follow-up in our study was um, eight years. So fairly long follow-up for this, this group of patients. 23 patients, it was their primary untethering and then two had had tether, uh, untethering at an outside hospital. Um, the majority were, were male and then the clinical presentation um, was varied and included, um, in addition to prophylactic untethering, those uh, that were associated with scoliosis, back or leg pain, bowel or bladder dysfunction, um, weakness, and sensory disturbances. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of syrinx length, so change in syrinx length over time, pre-op and post-op. Um, an average of eight year follow-up for those uh, with varying uh, pathologies such as diastomatomyelia, lipoma, lipomyelomeningocele, myelocystocele, meningocele, and then a, um, a thickened or fatty phylum. And uh, here, so a no change, if you don't see a bar, there was no change in the syrinx length. And then a, a bar, um, upward is a positive change, so an increase in syrinx length, and then a negative number would be a decrease in syrinx length. And what you, what you can see here is that the response was variable. There was not a consistent response to cord untethering. There was not a consistent response to syrinx size after cord untethering. Next slide, please. Here is the same graph for syrinx width. Um, the one the one um, pattern that we did see, and this is not surprising, for those with a myelocystocele, um, the syrinx uh, did decrease in width. But other than outside of the myelocystocele pathology, um, the change in syrinx size was inconsistent. Next slide, please. Um, and here is a <laughs> summarized view of each pathology for change in length on top and change in width on the bottom. Next slide. In terms of clinical response to surgery, um, of the 25 patients, seven had improvement in at least one presenting symptom, eight had stable symptoms, six 
were asymptomatic and remained asymptomatic. And five had newer worsening symptoms, but I'd like to mention that scoliosis was including included as a symptom as well as pain. Um, and that was the majority of these newer worsening symptoms. Um, and then finally, when really looking at each individual patient and trying to draw conclusions in terms of change in syrinx size and change in symptoms, there was no clear relationship between um, symptoms, uh, symptom change and change in syrinx size. Next slide, please. So to sort of bring it back to um, what does this mean for tether cord associated syrinxes? On the left uh, is, is a typical appearance of a, um, a large Chiari associated syrinx. I'd also like to note the septations. And then on the right, I have three examples of syrinx in the setting of tethered cord. And um, they're, they're different syrinxes. They're located in different areas of the spine and their morphologic changes as well as their differential response to surgery um, does suggest that there is a different pathophysiologic mechanism. And this is something that, um, you know, we've thought about and I, there are different theories which I won't, uh, you know, emerging sort of discussions that I won't really get into here, but um, I will say that there's a likely uh, a different mechanism at play. Um, next slide. Um, uh, I know we don't talk a lot about the septations within syrinxes, so I just, for this group here, wanted to throw in this slide. Um, of our cohort of about 280 patients with syrinx, um, it is interesting that those with tethered cord or spinal dysrhythmism associated syrinx didn't really have those septations that I just showed you on the prior slide, um, which is interesting. And I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, I'd like to think with this group, especially more about you know, what that means and, and why we see that difference um, in our tethered cord patients compared to our Chiari patients. Next slide, please. Um, so here are the, um, the, the graphs that I was alluding to at the beginning of the, the talk or that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, these are two recent articles, one from the uh, Vanderbilt group as well as from the Park Reeves uh, Syringa Myelia Consortium. Um, and what I want to point out here is that these are Chiari associated syrinxes. And what we see is that, you know, in general, as a rule, Chiari associated syrinxes after surgical decompression for Chiari improve. Um, you know, there are different um, uh, thresholds to, to um, uh, determine whether or not we're, we're calling a syrinx improved or resolved. But in general, as we all know, um, they improve after surgery. And this is in distinct contrast to what I just showed you for our cohort of 25 patients where the response to surgery was um, quite variable. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, for tethered cord, um, sorry. Okay. Um, for uh, tethered cord associated syrinx. Uh, there is inconsistent radiologically imp radiologic improvement in the syrinx after surgery for tethered cord. Um, and there's no clear relationship between, um, there's no clear relationship between symptom resolution and uh, change in the size of the syrinx. Um, do you mind moving that box? Okay, thank you. Um, and that based on our data, I would, I would uh, suggest that syrinx is associated with closed spinal dysrhythmism, likely have a distinct pathophysiology from Chiari associated syrinx as such. Um, and given their inconsistent improvement, um, the decision to um, untether a cord um, uh, could be directed more at clinical symptoms and not necessarily um, resolution of the syrinx itself. And then, of course, more study is needed to determine both the natural history of tether cord associated syrinx and the response to surgery. Thank you to um, my colleagues at University of Michigan, including Dr. Bruzek, who is the lead author on this study, um, as well as mentioned uh, Cormac Moore, Kern Morasco, and Hugh Garden. Thank you, Dr. Straley. Sorry, I thought I was sharing just the one screen. Um, there is a question in the chat. Do you see a differential in symptomatic improvement in the setting of a lesser change in the syrinx? We did not see a relationship between, um, yeah, 
those syrinxes which fail to improve and clinical symptoms. I have a question. Uh, how do you distinguish between uh, uh, residual central canal and spinal cord in some of these patients, uh, particularly when uh, there is no symptomatic or uh, imaging improvement? And um, we see uh, residual central canal in many, many patients these days. Correct. So our definition was um, three millimeters. So um, anything that was larger than three millimeters, we considered a syrinx. Um, and you are, I agree, you are right in terms of some of these developmental anomalies. Um, and you saw from the morphology of the syrinxes, they're not distended cavities like we typically see with syrinx that are, you know, enlarging the cord itself. So, but for sake of being consistent with how we were analyzing these patients compared to other patients, we did use a definition, and I should have mentioned this earlier, of three millimeters um, in width and cross-sectional width as a minimum threshold for the definition of syrinx. Anything less than three millimeters we considered um, not a syrinx or resolved. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think in the interest of time, sorry, Dr. Shaley, we're going to move yep. on. <laughs> um, so Dr. Jlui would be next. So I'm going to share specifically the one screen. Let's going to do that again. <clears throat> and I think you can.